Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the Produce Buzzers Podcast. We're so happy that you've joined us today, and I think you will be too after the show is over. You will have learned a lot about fresh fruits and vegetables, how to prepare them, what their nutritional value is, uh, all about their history and origin. We hope you'll find it interesting, and we hope it inspires you to eat more fresh fruits and vegetables, not only to improve your health, but to enjoy their deliciousness while you do so. To all our new listeners, welcome to the Produce Buds podcast. We hope you'll enjoy it and stick around to hear what we have to offer today. And for our previous listeners, our longtime listeners, welcome back. We are joined once again by Teresa Nolan, president and founder of Produce Buzz, and also Rick Stepp. He's a contributing editor to Produce Buzz, and the lovely Cynthia Benedetto, also a contributing editor to Produce Buzz. I'm Edwin Stepp, your host. The four of us have all worked together for a long time in the produce industry, so we have some information based on our experience and also on current and recent research to provide you with all you need to know about fresh fruits and vegetables. In today's episode, we're going to be featuring Cynthia Benedetto and Rick Stepp. They're going to tell us about some veggies that are inspiring them as fall begins. And we will once again play our mystery fruit or veggie quiz challenge. Stick around and play along and see if you can guess the mystery fruit or veggie of the day. And... Are you a super taster? What is a super taster, you say? Well, stick around and find out. You might be a super taster. So let's get started. Cynthia, do you want to tell us about squash today, I believe? Yeah, my choices tend to originate in the produce department in terms of when I'm looking for inspiration for what I'm going to cook for dinner. So although there are still a lot of summer fruits around, I, you know, it's September, mid-September, and I like to embrace mother nature. And I got butternut squash this week. I roast the butternut squash and then cube it up, put it into a saucepan, and then add some some kind of liquid, usually like a, a vegetable broth. And voila, there you have soup. Winter squash are coming into uh, season versus summer squash, which is the uh, summer squash with the zucchini and the yellow squash. And examples of the winter squash are more like uh, the spaghetti squash, acorn squash, butternut squash. It's high in fiber, vitamin C, magnesium, vitamin A, and potassium. So it's just an easy fix. Whatever squash I get, I have the produce department cut it in half for me because to you about need an ax to get through these things. I don't want to ruin one of my knives or nor do I have necessarily the strength to get through like a, a spaghetti squash. A lot of diabetics will use spaghetti squash instead of pasta with red sauce. But um, I just like to have olive oil or salt, pepper on it, and then make it a side dish or make it for a soup. Very good. The uh, back to your soup recipe. You said you cubed it, roasted it. No, uh, I I have the produce guy cut it in half. Yeah, and that's a great and, tip. I'd never thought about that. You know, I've cut, tried to cut those as well, and it, you're right. You need an axe, a lot of strength. I never thought about asking my produce guy. A good tip for our listeners there. <clears throat> anyway, Scrape so. out the seeds and put some olive oil on it, salt and pepper. And uh, sometimes I'll put uh, cinnamon or nutmeg on it. It's just, it's like roasting a potato. Yeah, but you and said you, you made a soup out of it. Yeah, so then I uh, put it on, on the top of the stove, throw in some vegetable broth, and then puree it up. Yeah, that's where I was going. I wondered you, 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 if you pureed it. You never said that. I just wanted to clarify that. That's good. Yes. Yeah, spaghetti squash, squash is a great alternative to pasta. The texture is very similar and better for you, I think. Yeah, you know, and I, so I what I'll... You, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say that the spaghetti squash I usually use as a side dish. So instead of rice or a potato, 
I'll use that as a side dish. Yeah. I will give you one tip with any kind of winter squash. What I do, and you know, I'm sure you've probably done this before, is I just take a, a good sharp knife and cut slits in the butternut squash or the spaghetti squash or the acorn squash. Cut slits in them and cook them in the microwave for about six minutes. But you have to put the slits in to let the steam escape. And then it's very easy to cut open and it's delicious. It, it steams the squash in its own skin. And in my opinion, you don't even need any seasoning. They are excellent just like they are. And don't throw the seeds away. Just because just like pumpkins, pumpkin seeds, you can roast those and they're delicious and they're very good for you. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And I found an article that said, if you, you know, if you want to slice the butternut squash, if you put it into the microwave for about two to three minutes, it will make it softer to cut. So I'm surprised that um, you guys that are so healthy living, unlike the heathen sugar, sugar heathen that I am <laughs> or olive oil um, that you use the microwave. Well, I don't. Ooh, there's a long thing of silence there. <laughs> I'm not big. Gosh, on, we never I'm thought not, of it. Yeah, I'm not big on microwaves. They've done microwaves. studies, and vegetables are more nutritious if they're steamed in the microwave than any other way of cooking them. But you can't overcook them. Most of, most foods just don't taste good cooked in a microwave to me. But I, that's Agreed. interesting about the squash. Mm -hmm. I, I I would be willing to try that. Well, even. Uh, you can put veg. I have a microwave vegetable steamer. You put just a little bit of water in the bottom, and then there's a basket you put in there, and you put your vegetables in there, and you yeah, steam it for about five minutes, and it's really flavorful. You don't even need, in my opinion, the vegetables taste so good. You don't even need any seasoning. Right. Yeah. Well, if they're if they're more nutritious cooked in a microwave, they're probably also going to be more tasty because that means they're they're not losing all that flavor. So that yeah. Makes sense. I have used it a lot to, or used it at times to speed up the cooking of a baked potato. <laughs> you know, like sure. you say, cook it yeah. a little while, like Teresa was saying, to cook cook it for a few minutes, and then you can pop it in the oven to finish it off, and it goes a lot faster. <laughs> so, okay, well that's great. Thank you, Cynthia, for educating us about some those squashes, winter squash, and now we'll turn to Rick. And Rick today is going to tell us about a certain class of vegetables that are very healthy. Rick, what are you talking to us today about? Well, today I'd like to talk about cruciferous vegetables. And a lot of people may not be familiar with that name, but it is a whole class of vegetables, and I'll list some of them later. But uh, they are vegetables of the cruciferae family with many species and cultivar cultivars being raised for food production. The family takes its alternative name, Crucifera, which is Latin for cross-bearing. And that's named for the shape of their flowers, whose four petals resemble a cross. In North America, they are also known as coal crops, hence the name coleslaw. Hmm. You can make coleslaw from broccoli and other cruciferous vegetables as well, but mostly we think of it with, made with cabbage. And cabbage and they, is cruciferous, I guess. Yeah. Right. And they're they're called coal coal crops, which I don't know if that's a shortened form of cold crops because they do grow in the cooler time of the year. Uh, in the UK and Ireland and Australia, they are known as brassicas. Cruciferous vegetables are one of the dominant food crops worldwide. They are high in vitamin C, soluble fiber, and contain multiple nutrients and phytochemicals. If you notice there's, they're not necessarily that much that high in multiple vitamins, but um, these nutrients and phytochemicals are very important for nutrition. And so here's a list of some of the cruciferous vegetables that are readily available in supermarkets. I never even knew this, but horseradish is cruciferous. Hmm, I didn't know that. Kale. Yeah. 
kale, collards, Chinese broccoli, Savoy cabbage, Brussels sprouts, kohlrabi, broccoli flour, cauliflower, bok choy, Chinese cabbage, Napa cabbage, turnip greens, mustard greens, rutabaga, arugula, radishes, watercress, and wasabi. And there's a lot more than that that I did not list because it would probably be difficult to find them in a grocery store. And that's amazing. I didn't realize a lot of those were cruciferous. Yeah. And, <clears throat> yeah. And the thing that makes them so special is uh, the, the chemicals contained in cruciferous vegetables induce the expression of the liver enzyme CYP1A2. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> Wasn't that they a are... character in Star Wars? Yeah, I think so. CYP3. <laughs> CP3 oh. should be could be they keep making new ones so I think we should suggest that it could be look like a broccoli or something but it does something to uh, induce the uh, liver enzyme the, the, the liver makes that enzyme and uh, they're potentially involved in de detoxification of carcinogens such as alpha toxin High consumption of cruciferous vegetables has potential risk from allergies and interference with drugs such as warfarin, which is a blood thinner. So taking, uh, if you're taking anticoagulant therapy, you should be cautious and talk to your medical doctor about eating them consistently. I know my doctor told me as long as I eat this, this relatively the same amount consistently, that it was okay. See, but, that would be not a problem for me because I'd be like, okay, no cruciferous, psh, no problem. <laughs> which I, I got to make sure that I keep my meds right. <laughs> which brings us to the next thing. I would bet any of you $500 that Cynthia is a super taster. Have you ever been diagnosed super as a taster. Super, super taster? She has super um, taste. I know that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, whom would I be diagnosed from? Well, it actually is a it actually is a genetic thing. In fact, I first found out about it because my grandson is a super taster, uh, and he does have some Jew in him, so that could be me. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> He's got a lot of different nationalities in him because his mother has a whole mixture of nationalities. I'm like a lapperdoodle. So yeah. go ahead. Tell me um, what type of doctor diagnosed makes this diagnosis. Well, probably a neurologist. I'm, I'm just guessing, but super tasters like uh, my oldest grandson who can taste uh, super tasters, super tasters can taste phenyl theocarbamide. Short for that is PTC, which is either bitter or tasteless. And, uh, Super tasters are much less likely to find cruciferous vegetables palatable. Because? Well, because of the chemical. Probably. Well, it's, this, this comes next. Okay, sorry. Yeah, so my grandson. Did I win $500? You, yeah. <laughs> no, you've got to bet. You, know, you have to get Cynthia diagnosed for. Oh, okay. Got it. <laughs> but uh, like I said, my grandson. You could not force him to eat cruciferous vegetables. He absolutely is a super taster. And uh, to give you an example, you know, the, we know that this taste, the sense of taste and the taste of smell are interconnected, correct? Like if you've ever had a cold, you notice that you can't taste things as well. Well, this is an example. His dad had shot a deer and was tracking it through the woods and Henry was, Henry was with him and they lost the blood trail. And so they thought, well, we're going to lose this deer. And Henry was four years old. He looked up at his dad and said, I can smell the deer. And he said, Oh, you can. Huh? He said, yes, I can smell it. He said, it's, he pointed, he says, it's over there. So Phil thought, well, why not? He walked exactly where he said, and there was the deer laying there. Amazing. He smell that deer. And, and Phil said now he, he smelled the blood or he had the scent 
of the so he's like a coon hound. Yeah, it was probably the blood that he smelled. Mm-hmm. I'm guessing, but he couldn't believe it because nobody smells a deer from that distance, you know. Yeah, and I'm sorry to say, but since he was little, I've tried to feed him things at my house that are healthy, and he will he does not trust me anymore. <laughs> He, he says no i like what i like the food that i have at home i don't want oh wow yeah and then and then when you're coming to visit him he probably can smell you coming so he goes, probably so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's really interesting yeah. maybe yeah. maybe it's not super tasting and super smell maybe he's just uh clairvoyant or you know exactly uh, <laughs> well, ESP. Maybe, maybe that is one of the traits of a clairvoyant. what was that movie i see dead people i see dead beers <laughs> <laughs> maybe it has to do with like more magnetic the magnetic vibrations and he's like really magellan and it's like super direction <laughs> <laughs> well, you said he had a lot of different, uh, his, his genetic makeup was quite varied. Maybe there's some bloodhound in there. Somewhere. Well, there's actually <laughs> evidence genetically that certain people from different parts of the world uh, use that to avoid poisonous plants. Well, I evolved that way. Yeah, I did know that, like, um, I learned this in one of these classes, who knows what it was, but um, that children, they have their tongues develop, um, I think, sweet first. Is that how it is? Um, Or whatever the taste they they develop first so that that is to protect them uh, back in the days for uh, if they were eating things in the wild, they wouldn't eat something poisonous. Yeah. It does go well. People who study genetics believe that. I don't know if it's been proven, but um, a super taster is a person who tastes certain flavors and foods more strongly than other people. The human tongue is wrapped in taste buds. The small mushroom shaped bumps are covered with taste receptors that bind to the molecules from your food and help tell your brain what you're eating. Some people have more of these taste buds and receptors, so their perception of flavor is stronger than the average person. They are known as super super tasters and are particularly sensitive to bitter flavors and cruciferous vegetables. Hmm. So they actually have more taste buds than the average person. Yeah, it's 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 actually repulsive to them. But is that physically, is that the only way you would be? If you're a super taster, you have more taste buds, or could you still be a super taster with the average amount of taste buds? Well, I, I don't know the answer to that okay. question, but uh, but I would not have believed that until this experience with my grandson because right, it's, I mean, absolutely would be just torture if you made him eat those. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, uh, Keo's a better eater than I am because I was not going to let her uh, have my limited palate, but I... I don't, broccoli is not my favorite. I will choke it down, but um, I'm not very good on uh, definitely texture, but like cilantro, ugh, yeah, you know, a little bit goes a long way. So when you're saying like, Scott has cilantro, I'm like, okay, we're having separate guacamole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll make one with onions for you and no cilantro and one with me. <laughs> no I use that. I had uh, the other night we went and they had uh, plantains, but they uh, used the micro uh, micro sprouts on them of the uh, cilantro. Oh, wow. Did it have the cilantro flavor still? Must yes, it did. Yeah. And, and that's the thing that they're, they're really, uh, they have more flavor. Like if you took just oh. a little leaf, you're like, oh, it's cilantro. Yep. Hey, I do have a little bit more on this, uh, on the super tasters. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. Super tasters are born with this ability. Indeed, research suggests a person's genes may be responsible for their super tasting abilities. Scientists believe most super tasters have the gene TAS2R38, which increases bitterness perception. The gene makes super tasters sensitive to bitter flavors in all foods and drinks. And about 25% of the population qualifies as super tasters. And they don't say anything about uh, specific regions or uh, ethnicities? No, but I have read another article on it once about that, that uh, different cultures evolved as a defense against poisonous plants and that kind of thing. But, uh, but what I was surprised is that about 25% of the population qualifies as super tasters. Yeah, that surprises me too. Yeah, so it's definitely in different degrees. Because I would say that I'm a super taster and the opposite. <laughs> ever since I was ever since I was a child, I loved vegetables. I remember loving, and I even uh, when I was in grade school, they used to serve us serve us sauerkraut, and I loved sauerkraut. And none of the kids liked it, and they would all give me their sauerkraut at lunchtime. I had like a whole plate full of sauerkraut. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. So I was always kind of the opposite. That's why I was shocked about my grandson, you know, for being re repulsive to him. And that's probably why when I was saying earlier, I can steam vegetables and put no seasoning on them. And the flavor is just excellent to me. Yeah. Uh, but some people, I guess, have to put salt on them in order to choke them down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that's all I had on that. That was interesting, though. I don't think I've ever heard that before, anything about super tasters. But I do know, that, you know, one of my daughters, my middle daughter, Julia, she mm -hmm. could be a super taster, I think. Yeah. She's got an incredible um, sense of smell, um, and she is very sensitive to foods like broccoli and you know, she doesn't really like them. She'll eat them, but she she's sensitive to them. But she can pick out smells like unbelievable, you know. Yeah. And about taste and smell r related, I think you all know this, but the, on our tongue, we only sense, I think now they say five different uh, tastes. Sweet, bitter, sour, salty, and now they say umami. Have you heard that? No. Mm -mm. <clears throat> umami is more of a kind of a, I don't quite understand it to explain it, but it's uh, kind of that, uh, that the sensation that you get when something is really good, like from a, like, like from an avocado, mm -hmm. you know, when you eat an avocado, that, that, um, that the oils in it, uh, yeah. I think, or what give you this kind of umami, um, uh, a flavor, taste. a flat, a fat flavor. Yeah, I think it is. It's it's kind of sensing and tasting the fat as opposed to those other things. And, and every other every other taste that we sense comes through the nose. Yeah. U M A M I. I think it's Japanese. Yeah, it is. Oh, okay. Mommy. Mm -hmm. I thought at first you said mommy, and I thought well, it must be from <laughs> breastfeeding. <laughs> Probably breast milk gave gives babies an umami taste but uh, yeah. is there a definition <laughs> for that and the sugar in that you know? did you just look that up yeah it says uh yes the taste sensation that is produced by several amino acids and new nucleotides uh and it has a rich or meaty flavor characteristics uh, so of cheese of cooked meat mushrooms ugh. Soy, ripe tomatoes. Interesting. I bet part of the sensation from ice cream has to do with that as well. It's not just the sweetness of the ice cream. It's the fat flavor. Yep, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very good. So is that all we have today about cruciferous veggies? Yes, and as we go on throughout the year, we could talk more specifically about different types of cruciferous vegetables. But in my opinion, that's if you had to just pick 
one type of vegetable, that would be the one to pick because there seems to be so many health benefits in there. They don't run your blood sugar up. What know, the, kind of vegetable? The cruciferous. I think. Oh, oh, oh! I didn't. I didn't know if you gave an vegetables. example of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, just my opinion. Uh, no, I think that's right. I've read a lot about that, especially cancer fighting ability. Yes. So very good. Thank you, Rick. Well, it's time for this episode's version of the mystery fruit or veggie of the day quiz. Play along with the produce buzzers as they try to guess what today's mystery fruit or veggie is from the clues that I will give. And we'll see how well you do. Okay, produce buzzers, are you ready? Yes, for the let's go. Mystery fruit or veggie quiz. Okay, in today's world, the fruit or veggie, our mystery fruit or veggie of the day is one of the most useful and common in the produce aisle. But it wasn't always that way. In the 1800s, in Victorian England and in the emerging uh, economies of, of the United States, this, if you had this fruit or veggie at your dinner party, it was a sure sign of wealth. So much so that it was often displayed as the main centerpiece and decorations on the dinner table. I already know what it is. Go ahead. Well, you can guess. That's all right. If you know, you I don't want to. <laughs> the pineapple. Nope. Sorry. I was ah! going to say, I, no, the pineapple <laughs> means like welcome, doesn't it? Isn't that like, yeah. Yeah, like that? Yeah. But, now, I that was going to say. That might have been true. Yeah. The pineapple, it was true. What, what I said <laughs> may be true, but that wasn't my choice. And we'll go through okay. now. I say the pear. Sorry, not pears. Damn it. <laughs> okay, you guys have already had your guess. I want more information if he's okay, going to get it. Okay, let's go. <laughs> this fruit or veggie, like those cruciferous vegetables, which I'll go ahead and say it's not, mm -hmm. uh, this fruit or veggie is very healthy for you in many ways, but some in the past thought eating it brought another great benefit. The Romans thought it was an aphrodisiac. And Casanova, you know him, so famous for his sexual escapades, also thought this, and he ate a lot of it to fire up his romances. And the wife of Louis XV fed him soup made from this fruit or veggie in hope that there would be plenty of opportunities for her to give him a lot of heirs to the throne. <laughs> That's probably not enough information for you to guess, but there is a little clue in there that might narrow it. The fact that they made soup from it. King Tut was buried with a collar that contained the leaves of this fruit or veggie. So the Egyptians thought it was very important as well. But remember, it's a very common, today it's common, ordinary. But in those past, it was considered something much greater. The fruit or veggie needs just the right soil to grow it. And because of that, it took a long time to make its way from Europe and Britain to the U.S. Thomas Jefferson, who had quite a green thumb, eventually gave up trying to grow it in Virginia. It wasn't until late 1800s that it was first grown commercially in Michigan near Kalamazoo, because the soil there was perfect for it. And both Dutch and Scottish immigrants in that area claim to be, they can't claim the credit for bringing it to Michigan. Today, it's not considered luxurious at all, but it was one of the main ingredients of one of the signature dishes of a famous luxury hotel in New York City. And it also adorns a very famous cocktail. Any guesses? Olives? Nope. I don't think they grow olives in Michigan. Oh, that's true. Nice I was thinking here. the cocktail, dirty martini. <laughs> well, yeah, that's right. You did and say it's a, a garnish, correct? It is a garnish in the cocktail. 
Mm -hmm. So that's going to narrow it down probably. Well, maybe not. There's, that could be a lot of different things, but the, I'll, I'll give you another hint about the luxury hotel. This very famous dish there was a salad. I'm going to guess a celery. Celery, Rick, you got it. Oh, what took you oh off? wow. What took you off? The garnish and wah, the drink? <laughs> <laughs> the I thought it was going to be something sexy. <laughs> That's the only thing that gave it away was the garnish because there's not that many vegetables that you use for a garnish. Yeah, but there's fruit. No, you but know yeah, fruit he said or fruit or veggie. or veggie. Yeah, but the soup part. You know, yeah. No, was, that's good. I'm glad you got it. I didn't want us to go. I, mean, I know that some of these clues, I'm, I was going to give you much better clues coming <laughs> right up. So we, we, you know, I know these first clues I give are pretty obscure and don't really help much, but they're interesting facts. <laughs> okay. So, well, that's great. Uh, the, the next clue I was going to give is that this, this veggie is one part of the Holy Trinity in, in, in New Orleans kicking. And we, I think we talked about that in a previous episode. What is the Holy the Trinity? The mirepoix. Yeah. Mirepoix, which is carrots. carrots onions and celery right and the holy trinity in in new orleans though they they have uh pep uh they substitute peppers for the carrots i believe so it's celery onions and peppers mm. Mm. But that's uh yes that's exactly right like bell peppers i think uh, bell probably, peppers are like spicy pepper they're probably like bell peppers although they do use a lot of spicy peppers down there so it could have been uh could have been from you know it could be spicy peppers um and i don't know if you guys were ever fans of the sci the british sci-fi series doctor who did any of you ever watch that no i've heard of it the fifth doctor which was sometime i think in the 70s they're up i don't know what number they're up to now you know every 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 time the doctors would like the James Bond, they would you know they have to get a new actor. They would, but they rather than saying it was still it was always the doctor, but they'd always have a new doctor come on and they would explain it that he regenerated himself and became something different. And I think <laughs> actually the latest one is now a woman playing the doctor. <laughs> but the fifth doctor in Doctor Who used to wear a celery sprig of celery on his lapel. And in one episode, okay, so that kind of seems nerdy. Yeah, that kind of <laughs> seems nerdy. Yeah, so in one episode, they <laughs> that uh, makes sense. Yeah, they had, yeah, mm -hmm. they had a character ask him, "So why why do you wear a stick of celery on your lapel?" And he said, "Does it offend you?" And he goes, "No, I'm just curious." And then the doctor said, "It's a safety precaution. I'm allergic to certain gases in the praxis range of the spectrum. How does the celery help?" He asked. If the gas is present, the celery turns purple. <laughs> and then the character says, and what do you do then? He goes, I eat the celery. If nothing else, it's good for my teeth. <laughs> <laughs> but it's very, I think found it fascinating that this, that something we see is so common, you know, celery. We don't think of it oh, as, as, as uh, as a luxury item, but it was in those days. And they used to, mm -hmm. I saw some photos of some of the uh, vases they would put the celery in. They'd take big stalks, leave the leaves on them, put them in the vase and put it right in the center of the table. And the bigger the stalk of celery, you know, the more impressed, I guess, people were <laughs> from it. <laughs> well, and you know, with celery, if it starts to go limp, you can put it in water and it kind of rejuvenates. So keep putting it in the water probably kept it from that's true. I'm too. sure that was a reason because they didn't have refrigeration yeah. then. So that was probably yeah. one reason to do it. And yeah, another Calum is hard to grow. Like in Virginia, they couldn't grow it very well. Yeah, I'm, maybe they've overcome it. You know, and now I think you could probably create the right kind of soils. But the soil is, they call it muck. It's a certain, there's a certain balance between water and, you know, really rich soil. Yeah. Um, and Kalamazoo area was the place that, they found that was already had it naturally and Kalamazoo is, is known as the celery city and they have a museum there to celery. <laughs> wow. That's wow. cool. <laughs> also Florida, you know, around Lake, Lake Okeechobee, they grow celery and they have a muck soil there. Okay. Yeah. But California grows the best celery of all. Yeah. And they are the biggest producer. Now there's not much grown in Michigan anymore at all. 
yeah. because of urbanization primarily in that area and manufacturing that that kind of overtook things. But yeah. But I don't know the soil they grow those the celery in in California. I don't know if it's considered muck. But I don't know either. But they must have they must have to get it to some point that's close to it. I I know there are. Like we used to represent the artichoke board, mm -hmm. and, and Teresa can correct me. I'm, my memory is a bit faint on that, but the they used to grow the, those grew best in these what they call the sloughs or the sloughs. I don't know how you say that word, but it was mm -hmm. where there was the the the, the soil was very muck. that's like a drainage ditch, but it was it was yeah. like very <laughs> thick muck. Yeah, so it probably is a. In fact, in, I know around Lake Okeechobee they call it, they call it muck. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's what they called it in Michigan as well. So, yeah. In fact, one time when you know, I guess you you worked for the Artichoke Board as well as Teresa, and then Teresa hired me to do it after you had done it. Uh, they had me come out to California to see the artichoke growing and. It had rained really hard, and I went out into the field. They said, "Bring rubber boots because the soil is really like um, it, it's muddy. You, you'll ruin your shoes." Yeah, I wore those rubber boots in the field, and the mud was all caked on them. And when I went back to the hotel, I thought, "Well, I'll just rinse these off in the bathtub," <laughs> and it clogged that tub up. <laughs> It would not drop me. I had to call the call him and say, I'm sorry. I was rinsing my boots off. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. Rather oh. Than, I don't think I ever walk. walked in those fields, but I saw them. But anyway, so California must have some muck for celery yeah. growing. <laughs> they grow most of it yeah. in the country. <clears throat> I know they grow a lot in Florida. That famous salad, did anybody guess what the famous salad was from the New York City Hotel? Oh, Waldorf? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but the Waldorf, I think that the Waldorf is, when I think Waldorf, I think nuts, grapes, <laughs> onions, apples. and celery. Apples and celery. Yeah. Yep. The, 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 that is it now, but the original, the original uh, salad version first created sometime in the 40s, I believe. Uh, it was only apples, celery, and mayonnaise. No, no, no nuts, nuts, no grapes. Wow. So it, it evolved. I think the latter version is much better, <laughs> yeah. in my mm -hmm. opinion. <laughs> but uh, anyway, that was, <clears throat> a, lot, a lot of people didn't know that. So the celery was like, you know, big time star in that salad. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, now it's like the hardware item of, of the kitchen. Yep, that's mm -hmm. true. Uh, of course, you can't eat buffalo wings without them either. You know, keep, keep take the heat out of those buffalo wings. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's been around for a long time. King Tut probably ate it. He wore it, at least. We know that. And it was mentioned in, by Homer and Pliny. Uh, Hippocrates um, prescribed it as a nerve soother. And hmm. it's been used for a lot of different medical cures throughout the ages. I won't list them all, but um, the, 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 you know, various cultures throughout history found different uses to heal certain problems, especially when it like digestion and constipation. That was the biggest thing, for, <laughs> and probably was true. Some of the other things were probably a little suspect, especially the aphrodisiac. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute, oysters aren't a, a fruit or vegetable, right? Well, now I'm, <laughs> next time I order oysters, I'm going to have some celery with them. <laughs> you know, you can, they sell celery root extract in health food stores. Oh, that's right. I think I have seen that before. I've never bought it. Do they There's say a, what it's for? Buy that? I don't know. It'd be interesting to find out. Yeah. Well, that's the other thing. You can eat everything about the celery plant. You know, the celery root is mm -hmm. good. The stalk, the leaves, everything. So, And maybe yeah. in those days they ate every bit of it, not just the the, the stalks. Maybe maybe the root was actually yeah. what they thought was so medicinal. 
Well, I see it in the grocery stores even here, celery root. You know, I think they call it yeah. celery, celery rack or something. That's what they yeah. sell it or brand or not brand it, but that's the name for it rather than yeah. celery root. But uh, I've eaten them before. Not nothing to jump up and down about, but <laughs> uh, it was it was pretty good. I'm sure it's very good for you. <laughs> yeah. Now the Greeks, though, thought they, the Greeks associated celery with death, and <clears throat> they would put put garlands of celery leaves on the bodies of the dead for their funerals. Hmm. And that led to a common Greek expression, which they still use today, is. He now has need of nothing but celery. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard that before. <laughs> well, it's Greek. I don't think it made it into English, but anyway. Okay. <laughs> the other myth about, well, not that we've talked about myths, but uh, there, there has been this idea that celery is, has negative calories meaning that oh, it that takes it more takes calories you, yeah, to eat, to eat it and digest. It, right. <laughs> but that's actually not true. It's been disproven. But it is very low in calories, so <laughs> you're not going to get fat if that's all you eat. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yep. who could, like, I smear, you know, cream cheese on it or yeah, uh, there you peanut go. butter. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> These are supposed to be negative calories. <laughs> yeah, but they, go, they put the negative calories in quotes because it's – you could probably never get fat by just eating celery. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. You'd probably be really thin if you just ate celery and nothing else. Yeah. And malnourished. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did very well today guessing the mystery fruit of the veggie. We got to the answer a lot quicker. Uh, so congratulations, Rick, for figuring that one out. Well, Produce Buzzers podcast fans, it's time for your favorite or maybe your most hated segment of Produce Buzzers podcast. It's time for Homegrown. (laughs) And we always turn to our, our leader, Teresa Nolan, to bring us the best and the worst puns that she can find relating to vegetables. Teresa. What are you going to assault us with today? <laughs> okay, I have a I have a short story. There were two squash who were best friends, and they were walking down the street together, and they stepped off a curb, and a speeding car came around the corner and ran over one of them. So the uninjured squash called 911, helped his injured friend as best he was able. The injured squash was taken to the emergency room and rushed into surgery. After a long and agonizing wait, the doctor finally appeared. He told the uninjured squash, I have good news and I have bad news. The good news is that your friend is going to pull through. The bad news is that he's going to be a vegetable for the rest of his life. Oh. Oh. <laughs> you did it again. <laughs> Emmaus grown, <laughs> homegrown. No, that was great. Thank you, Teresa. And thank you, listeners, for bearing with us as we assault you with another pun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, listeners, for tuning in to the Produce Buzzers podcast, brought to you by Produce Buzz a gathering place for lovers of fresh fruits and veggies. We hope you were entertained a bit and educated a lot about fresh produce. Be sure to join us next time, and please tell your friends to do so as well. Like, share, and comment on our Produce Buzz Facebook page. And check out our website at www.producebuzz.com. There you will find articles about fresh fruits and veggies how to select, store, and prepare them, as well as lots of interesting facts about all the wonderful bounty the earth provides for us. Until next time, be fruitful, and don't forget to veg out.